How's it going, everybody? Today we have a very special guest, Robert Brennan from Sony. First of all, how are you doing today, Rob? And could you go ahead and introduce yourself to people who may not know you? Sure, absolutely. And first, you know, thanks for the opportunity to come on and, uh, and chat with you. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, so my name is Rob Brennan. I'm the technology and training manager for Sony North America. I'm essentially responsible for working with a lot of our kind of media partners, both kind of, we'll say old school and new school. Um, essentially, technology communication is, is my primary role. Beyond that, I also work quite a bit with our product development team and kind of collecting what we call voice as a customer. So uh, suggestions, recommendations, of course, uh, 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 complaints, you know, whatever they happen to be, but then collect all those and have discussions with our product planning team about how our customers are generally reacting to our products, our technologies, uh, and our services. And I've been uh, doing that for just about 13 years with Sony. Awesome. Yeah. So I, I did get the pleasure to meet you at um, CES, and that was really awesome to, to see the prototype unveiled and just see exactly, you know, what the future has in store for Sony. Yeah. Um, you know, regarding that prototype, when it comes to like the inception of it, I believe I know the answer to this, but could you inform the public and just like reiterate like how that technology for the TV was born? Was it born out of the creation of that reference monitor or was the reference monitor based on that technology itself? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so just real quick for anyone who's watching this that, that doesn't quite know what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about essentially a dynamic backlight system for an LCD-based television. Um, full array local dimming TVs have been around for a while. Mini LED has been around for a while. And these are all just different flavors of how power essentially can be manipulated through the backlight to help enhance the picture, make certain elements brighter, make certain elements darker, preserve black level, et cetera. Um, now, there is a new mastering monitor that Sony announced last year at NAB uh, that just started shipping beginning of February. This is the BVM HX3110, and it's designed to replace the BVM HX310. What makes it notable is that the 310 limits uh, the brightness range in the mastering process to 1,000 nits. And so if you were to, to watch probably 95% of all HDR content today, is limited to about a thousand nits. Now that's not a result of like all cinematographers and directors in some secret cabal in some like dungeness meeting room in Los Angeles, and they all have agreed that art uh, has limited itself to a thousand nits. It's because the workflow for going higher than a thousand nits is uh, difficult, time-consuming, and therefore expensive. So Sony released this new four thousand nit mastering model. That's kind of the impetus for this kind of discussion. It will enable um, essentially efficient and, and cost efficient um, production of much higher kind of brightness um, uh, cinematic content and, and, and TV content as well. And so the prototype television is basically a statement that says Sony consumer products are essentially ready for this much higher brightness requirement for films you know, down the road. Uh, now going to your question as to which came first, this is the cool part. The TV came first, the consumer set technology came first. The ability that we've kind of you know, tuned and I would say mastered uh, over the last maybe 10 or so years of backlight manipulation has been now put into the professional monitor. And that is what has enabled this new threshold for, for brightness in terms of artistic uh, creation. Awesome. That's great knowledge and like um, great information for, for viewers that might not have been knowing about like how the prototype was actually born and you know the history behind it. So you know right. on the topic of the prototype it's using a newer kind of mini LED technology. Is there a way that you're going to be able to kind of separate the old thought process of mini LED in people's minds towards what Sony's doing new with mini LED like for the future is there a way to separate that in people's minds like are you going to call it anything different you know it's like a we and a wii u situation in a way because people are going to be like familiar with old mini led technologies and not knowing the advancements how are you addressing exactly. that yeah you, you, you bring up a great point um when mini led was initially launched and again not to bash 
kind of other manufacturers that that, that operate in that space, it, the, the launch of it was not as good as the industry kind of hoped. Right? There was not, in most cases, a a kind of earth shattering difference between a mini LED based you know LCD television and full array local dimming. And again, for those that don't technically know, they're basically the same technology. Mini LED just refers to a different class of of light source that is about five times smaller. But essentially how the backlight works with boosting and dimming is essentially the same. So you bring up, you know, this really is kind of the elephant in the room. How is Sony going to differentiate? Um, Mini LED is a, 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 a word, let's say, that is kind of known in the market. So we are going to continue to use that uh, and to talk about it. Um, we, I, I, I could tell you the, the stories of some of the behind the scenes conversations. You can imagine probably how these go. It's like, is it going to be mini LED, like ultra super plus, <laughs> you know, and how many pluses can you add to the end of it? Right. We decided not to do that. You know, um, people understand kind of conceptually mini LED. They may not immediately know that Sony's approach is fundamentally different, not only in our technical capability, uh, which is what was on demonstration at in CES, but also Sony's general philosophy and approach to picture quality. Uh, we talk a lot about creative intent, um, whether it's for films you're watching or TV shows or video games, um, but we strive to make the most accurate picture possible, um, not to make a you know better picture. That's not what Sony's interested in. And so there is a lot of work that, that goes in. I'll be honest, a lot of it is grassroots. A lot of it is taking advantage of opportunities like this. Um, and then to show uh, uh, you and other people like you at CES in person what these technologies look like and allow you to explain what you saw to other people. Um, whether or not we end up coming up with some new grandiose name in the future, um, you know, time, time will tell. Uh, but for right now, mini LED is uh, you know, kind of a naming convention that's understood and accepted and what we're going to go with as far as the prototype itself is concerned, the mini LED LCD based television. Yeah. So within that prototype, what would you say is the most unique thing about that mini LED technology that separates yourself with the mini LED from every other manufacturer that does mini LED right now? Sure. I, th I think there are, there are two differences. There's a hardware component and there's a software component. Um, when, whenever you have kind of hardware uh, parity, which, ha which happens a lot in the TV space, right? Is that you'll have TVs from manufacturers that essentially are, have a hardware parity. What will make one television look different from another is all on the software side or you know the processor. So Sony televisions have uh, some of the most advanced processing in, in TVs. We've been building our own processors for about 27 years. Uh, and we, we put a lot of emphasis on R&D into that. So there's a component of that. Um, and it's been that way for a long time. But the prototype television um, brought a new piece of hardware that is unique to Sony. So we have our own microprocessor division. And we worked with their engineering team to design a new uh, IC, uh, basically a new integrated circuit, a new LED driver that's responsible for converting the digital signal uh, from the brain of the television into an analog signal that is read by the actual LEDs themselves, right? And the goal was to do two things. Um, significantly shrink it down because there's a physical limitation of, you know, you have all these big you know, integrated chips on your, back, on your backlight substrate. You can't fit a lot of LEDs to go with it. Uh, so we wanted to shrink it down, make it much smaller so we could physically add more LEDs uh, and then also um, improve the essentially the, the, the bandwidth, or how much data um, that that IC could handle, so that our zones could still be very dynamic, do on or off. But as we demonstrated to show you, kind of backlight gradation. Um, those are the two kind of physical um, uh, things we were looking for that are delivered by the hardware itself. So that is now a new unique factor in that prototype television compared to where the industry is at generally. Um, I still think our software, even with hardware parity, um, is compelling in and of itself, but the hardware just bumps it to a whole other league. And that's why we felt so strongly about giving everyone a demonstration 
and pulling off part of the LCD panel so you could see exactly what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Did you say that at CES, you, I believe you said it's the world's smallest LED driver. Is that correct? Is that still correct yes. after everything that was un unveiled? You know? Uh, yes, it's still the world's smallest driver. Uh, I don't have the actual measurements. It's about the size of a sesame seed. But again, the idea was not to make it smaller for the sake of, you know, this is in the 80s when, when people just wanted small for this. A lot of times it was just cool to be small. Um, by reducing the size, we've been able to um, uh, triple the amount of local dimming zones in the backlight. And that's a direct result of, of using much less space in the backlight for the driver itself. Now we have a whole lot of empty space where we can put more LEDs and maintain complexity of control. Uh, so it, it, it's kind of, um, uh, you know, oftentimes I think with marketing, you, you, you want to say, you know, we have the world something for whatever reason. Um, and it is the world's smallest, but it, it's designed to achieve this other specific goal, which was backlight density. Yeah, and you could really see that at the uh, prototype demo. That's one of the things that stuck out to me is how um, you could just see how finite the, the backlight control was in actually filling out the image. You could sort of make out the actual shape of the image, right. and, and it's just not like a blob, like some of the other technology that you'd see. Um, so I thought that was a really you know, cool, unique thing. Yeah, and that and that's and that's why we felt we really wanted to show that. We've never shown that kind of when I mean, it was Vegas, but that naked view of our of a TV before. Um, and and the reason it's really impactful, and I'm so glad that you you kind of noticed this, is in the past, you know, when when dynamic backlight first first came out, the whole goal was just preserve black level, just you know, dim it when I need to preserve you know, darkness in the scene. We've largely figured that out. Um, and then it became, okay, well, can we improve brightness? So then it became local dimming and local boosting, right? You'd suck power from one side of the screen and that would give you an energy surplus to boost up, you know, the brighter element. And then TVs kind of figured out how to do that. And then it became, okay, but can we have granular control? Can we do Black, near black, kind of black, sort of black, mostly black, all the grays, you know, the midtones, and various levels of brightness. And that power kind of management, that power delivery trick of various states is essentially what had to happen before we could bring it over to the mastering monitor I mentioned earlier. So it needed a, a high level of complexity before we could put it in a $35,000, you know, basically scientific measuring tool that filmmakers use. Yeah, wow, um, that's pretty cool. So um, the next couple of questions I have for you is kind of like getting into the inner workings of how a Sony TV works. So to help viewers that might own a Sony TV or want to buy a Sony TV understand like what's so unique about it and the different settings that are available. Because I don't think a lot of people are actually realizing um, some of the settings that are on Sony TVs are really unique. Sony TVs and one of the ones that I personally love is reality creation and I specifically I use it a lot in game mode believe it or not and I clean up some of the lower resolution textures that are in games because some of these games are going to ship and they have to get reduced for console so you know you might want to clean up those textures a little bit I also use it like with the Nintendo Switch can you speak to how reality creation works and what it does and like what's the intention for it what's it intended to be used for yeah, absolutely. So reality creation refers to kind of a whole suite of, of techniques that are used to first analyze the incoming video signal and then determine, okay, what do we do about it? How do we recreate it? And then how do we clean it is probably the best word to use. Again, enhance is not really the goal. It's more repair. There's mm -hmm. It's low quality due to compression, either because the source is compressed or the, the the streaming platform is going through the internet and you have compression, kind of fixing up those kind of issues. What reality creation essentially, where it comes from, is machine learning and AI. So over the last 27 or so years, um, of course, machine learning doesn't quite go back that far. <laughs> A lot of this used to be very manual. Um, but essentially, we've trained the processor to identify um, uh, characteristics of video and basically flag them as these are good, I should let these go through. 
and issues that need to be resolved. And through machine learning and now AI, which just speeds up machine learning, um, we're able to train the processors uh, much more quickly. So essentially what the processor looks for in every frame of video, it compares every pixel to every other pixel vertically, horizontally, diagonally, and then temporally. So it remembers the pixel it looked at last, and it's already reading ahead to the pixel for the next frame. And it does that so it can identify an object, right? And it says, this is a sphere, or you know, this is a high frequency kind of pattern. And it may not know the difference between you know, cotton and wool, uh, but it knows, you know, okay, this is a high frequency pattern. I know the characteristics of high frequency pattern. I know the characteristics of smooth curved shapes. It also is what allows the processor to determine the difference between things like film grain and noise. Um, by looking at how the pixels change over time, it can identify um, kind of aberrations that pop in and pop out on a, on, you know, like on a single frame, single pixel level. That's how it identifies these are errors mm -hmm. uh, that, are, that are, have, have happened somewhere. And I've been trained to not only identify the error, but now I can classify the error and I know what fix to apply. The one thing I will say about gaming is that you absolutely can engage reality creation with gaming. Reality creation does slightly slow down um, uh, the television's, again, response time because it, it's, it's, it's remembering the previous frame and it's looking ahead to the next frame while it's displaying kind of the frame in the middle. And so there is a slight input lag kind of penalty. You pay for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're playing games that are you know, locked at like 60 FPS. And so that's, you know, 16.67 milliseconds per frame. You know, that's fine. But if you're, if you're playing like competitively online, you know, and some teenager from the middle of the country keeps on, keeps on killing you and your KD ratio is just tanking, um, you know, you might, you might want to, for a short period of time, turn off that extra level of processing in the TV to improve input lag. The point is though, as a user or as a gamer in this case, you have lots of flexibility in what technologies you want to deploy. And it's all kind of a cost um, kind of analysis, uh, a kind of a pro-con decision. I get something, it costs me something. Uh, and what's the balance I'm looking for? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll get on uh, game mode a little bit more uh, in a little bit. But just to, to reiterate, like with reality creation, um, I noticed it kind of gets better each year. So if I'm understanding this correctly, it's an AI database. Is that correct? Uh, I would just be careful about using the word AI. This is not, it's not like a, a, something living in the chip. It's not watching what you watch and getting right. better on itself. It's essentially a machine learning um, process that we run. AI just speeds up machine learning. It's what enables, um, you know, uh, uh, software development to, to exponentially kind of speed up its process. So um, in the chip itself, we will then send firmware updates to improve kind of the data set. It's now better at detecting um, uh, errors. It now has more nuanced control over how to fix you know, certain things that it encounters. Um, as we continue to kind of diversify where you get your content from and the various kind of platforms that exist and the codecs that are used and the, the formats that are available, um, we continue to kind of analyze those different conditions to make sure that our processor is essentially trained sufficiently to work under all those kind of scenarios. And, and the real Sony advantage generally in this case is that not only have we been doing this for a very long time, um, but we started back in the analog days. Uh, digital is easier than analog. Analog, if you, if you could figure out how to do analog, it made your digital solutions much better. And Sony processors kind of bridge the gap all the way back to the analog days. So it really is kind of the secret sauce. Mm. Um, there have been you know, plenty of, kind of independent you know, shootouts or comparisons of a Sony you know, TV versus a competitor. And I mentioned before, you know, some in some cases, TVs have hardware um, parity. Mm -hmm. So you know, here's, a, here's, for example, last year, here's a Sony QD OLED. Here's a competitor QD OLED. If you ripped off this, the, the labels and looked inside, you would see same panel, probably with the same power supply comes from the same company. You know, HDMI board, there's like two companies that make those. It's like all the parts are, are, are coming from like half a dozen different companies. 
but then you turn them on even after professionally calibrating the two sets. The Sony, when it was independently kind of, kind of measured and evaluated by a panel of judges, absolutely hands down came out as the better television. It's because the processor is the secret sauce. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned the processor, the, the Sony XR processor. I think it's earned such a, a huge reputation it, like within the TV world, and I think rightfully so. And, it, you know, it is sort of built on AI. Is that, that's correct, right? Like, well, yeah, a, AI, is, AI is used in its development. But mm -hmm. again, I, would, I, think, I think calling it an AI chip, um, especially when they're so, AI is becoming so kind of uh, ambiguous and synonymous with everything, um, that I would, I would uh, just, I don't like using that, overly using that word when it doesn't actually apply. So in the chip itself, the, the, the chip is not an AI chip. Mm -hmm. We use AI and machine learning to uh, improve the software that runs on the chip itself. So I know that's maybe, maybe that's a distinction that's unnecessary, but that's the distinction that I make. Well, yeah, I mean, it's an important distinction to make because like I've been heard it called the cognitive AI processor, uh, you know, from Sony advertisements like a, a lot of times. So it's like understanding like what goes into it AI wise right. is really important for viewers, especially since AI is such a huge topic now, you know, and with the recent developments of like generative AI, for example, playing mm -hmm. a part in improving picture quality further beyond what's capable now. And if so, how could it coexist with Sony's vision of the creator's intent being intact still? Yeah, no, um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, could it play a role? Uh, I, I, yes, I, I, I imagine that it could. I mean, you've, you've certainly, I, I'm sure you and many other people have, have looked at like, YouTube videos where they've used you know, an AI upscaler, maybe like an NVIDIA AI upscaler. And at, at kind of casual glance, you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's pretty good. You do any kind of deeper level kind of critical analysis and you start to see, okay, there's a lot of kind of issues that are happening. There's kind of this, an overhanded smoothing effect and sharpening effect that, that kind of are at play and, and motion is again quite difficult. Um, AI is only going to get better. And that kind of, of kind of frame generation, that's especially used in gaming today, there is certainly the potential for that to continue to improve um, uh, and play uh, a significant role in the future. Um, and the one thing that I will say about Sony after working for 13 years is that we 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 typically do not put ourselves in a position where we put a pole you know flag in the ground and say you know this is the th this is the way this is the only way this can ever be done you know even from our our you know our TV lineup going back to TVs um, we don't make our own panels so we go to multiple manufacturers to source WRGB OLED QD OLED different types of LCD um, we use lamp based projectors laser based projectors. Uh, and it's all about finding the right technology, the right hardware, adding kind of Sony's uh, control or Sony's take on it, and then building a product that we think works uh, in terms of our philosophy and for our customer. Yeah, awesome. So you mentioned the the usage of others' panels. Uh, you find panels, <laughs> you source panels from different places, and you're sort of just always looking for the best technologies out there. Is that correct? Is that the biggest approach? Yeah. yeah, it's it's not just the best technologies because some, you know, sometimes something may come out, like, for example, mini LED. And although technically that's not a panel technology, but it's, it's a good example. You know, mini LED came out and Sony introduced a mini LED basically a year after the other manufacturers that jumped in because we wanted to take more time with it to kind of put our stamp on how we were going to use it. So... Mini LED is, I think, objectively better than full array local dimming, but we weren't ready to adopt it year one because it, it, we needed to kind of take the time to control it properly so that we could say yes. And this and this is Sony's Mini LED, not just you know the same thing with physically more you know um, uh, light sources in the, in the back of the TV. That that wasn't our approach. Now, to a degree, that's freeing because some of the other panel panel manufacturers, not all of them, but some of them also make, you know, their own televisions. And so they're, they, and I don't work for them, so I can't speak for them, but I think it's, it's fair to say that there's likely a 
a, a pressure if a panel division makes something new for like the TV division to then start using it and selling it so you can recoup the R&D costs, even if you haven't quite like mastered it yet. And Sony is not under that kind of pressure. Um, it does mean that we are selective. We do, we do want to make sure that we can get a panel technology or any kind of technology from you know, any of the vendors we work with, that it works uh, well within our ecosystem. Uh, and then it helps us to, to produce a good product that is distinguishable in a very crowded, you know, hyper-commoditized marketplace. Yeah. Awesome. That's all good to know. Um, so let's see. I got another question here kind of about one of the settings that's in Sony TVs that um, a user was asking me about. That specific setting was Black Adjust. Could you explain what this setting does and maybe give some examples of when somebody would want to use it? Sure. So um, first, uh, the, the, when you're thinking about contrast in general, right, how bright or how dark or just a general contrast adjustment to a picture, there are different approaches for whether you're looking at HDR or SDR content. So I do want to very quickly kind of touch on those. Um, in the world of HDR, we call that an absolute contrast system. So black is equal to, you know, zero nits. And then we follow the PQ2084 curve, and, and, and there you go. It's, it's fixed. With SDR, however, the relationship between how bright and dark is fixed, but the actual values can be different. So you can just brighten the entire image. You know, black gets brighter and white gets brighter, or you can dim the entire image. And that's usually done to account for, like, environmental conditions. Um, but with HDR, it's, it's very different. So that being said, when you're watching HDR content, if you go in and do something like a black adjust, uh, this becomes now a software manipulation where we will change the shape of the HDR or PQ2084 um, curve, which basically is just how you recreate whatever brightness level is coming in from the source. Um, so imagine it as a diagonal line going at 45 degrees. It's not actually that, but imagine it's just it's this linear black to white kind of kind of uh, uh, line. If you were to uh, adjust the black increase at the bottom of that line, it might undershoot a little bit and then follow the line. So that would be deepening the black, right? Letting the TV kind of sit in a darker area longer. It would kind of pull shadow details kind of down, um, and then it would follow the curve the rest of the way. Or you can drive out of black faster than prescribed, out of black, and then follow the line again. Um, so everything at the bottom end gets kind of brightened. And that's essentially what black adjust is doing. Again, it can be useful in for environmental reasons because HDR makes no adjustment for the fact that you're, you know, you know, you're in a room with huge windows and the light's streaming in and you're watching, let's say, Alien in HDR, and that entire movie is like a relationship between black, mostly black, kind of black, and like a couple of lights. Uh, and if you can't perceive those nuanced differences, it's hard to watch the movie. So you overshoot, right? You brighten the bottom end so you can see what's happening. And that's a way that you might use black adjust from a, from a kind of a recreation perspective. Beyond that, then there's purely preference. Um, if you increase uh, kind of the, the black adjust and bring, you know, uh, let's say enhance the darkness, right? So you undershoot the curve. Um, uh, it will increase your perceived perception on the screen. It makes the bright things seem brighter. And for all, they're as fancy as humans are, right? We have great medical technologies and scientific discoveries and philosophical kind of achievements. At the end of the day, we like bright, shiny stuff. We're like raccoons, right? If it's bright and shiny, we're going to grab it. And so some people want, will, will adjust the, 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 the contrast just because they like the picture. And if that's you, go for it. Um, but you can use it for those two reasons. One, environmental conditions don't match the kind of viewing uh, uh, expectation. And the second is, I just want it to look different because I want it to look different. But that's what Black Adjust is essentially, is essentially doing. Now, in SDR, instead of adjusting just the bottom end, you just slide the entire range up and down. So everything gets darker or everything gets brighter. And that's essentially what happens. Uh, in SDR, we call that gamma. 
Mm -hmm. So going from a gamma 1.8 mm -hmm. to 2.0 to 2.4 is just sliding the whole range up and down. But in HDR, the range never, never goes up and down. It's just the shape of that line. You know, is it going to be perfect and is it going to follow the standard? Is it going to, you know, be brighter at the bottom? In the mid-tones, are we going to boost the mid-tones? Um, those are options that, that you have control over in the team. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's really good insight. Um, I don't think I've ever heard that explained like that before. Um, so thank you. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. So one of the questions I got, um, we were kind of talking about reality creation within gaming earlier, and that kind of brings me onto the topic of uh, Sony's active image processing. So there's this thought that it's turned off in game mode, but when I use, say, a Sony TV and I play something like the Nintendo Switch, for example, I notice it cleaning up the image more than any other TV would do, like, traditionally. So is the truth that they're actually using processing in game mode or is processing turned off in game mode? It's a, it's a great question. Um, pro, first of all, processing your TV is never turned all the way off. Um, that, that would, that would be, that would be, that'd be bad. Um, there's, there, there are two things that essentially your TV is trying to do. Uh, one is account for variation of the TV itself, like e you know, each TV is built to a standard, but within that standard, there's kind of variability. So the TVs are calibrated to remove that variability on a unit by unit basis. And then there's the variability of the incoming signal uh, that might have deficiencies um, that need to be kind of corrected. Active processing is more like, well, let me try to improve upon the picture beyond just simple kind of um, repair and, and kind of recreation. So there's kind of these three levels. The bottom level, again, you can never turn off. The question becomes, uh, do I just want, you know, kind of a faithful recreation? If I, if I throw in, I can't think of the year it came out. And I don't know if you've ever watched this, but the, the old 1980s, like uh, Flash Gordon movie with Max von Sydow is in for me, me right? Yeah. Hilariously bad. I love this movie. Right, but if you want to faithfully recreate that VHS experience, you can do that. But you can also engage much more active processing to say, well, what if this movie was shot with modern sensibilities and was a little bit smoother and, and you improved the color gamut uh, and the contrast was higher and the black level was better? You can do that. So there's kind of these three tiers that exist. Again, going back to gaming, each of those tiers adds cycles, right? Just processing cycles within essentially the CPU uh, of, your, of your television. And so from an input lag perspective, that's where there's this potential for penalty uh, or the, let's say, trade-off as you kind of, kind of climb the processing you know, kind of ladder. Uh, so you can strike a balance. In game mode, the default operation is to turn off the, the higher levels of processing. Essentially, the TV favors input lag reduction over picture enhancement. And that's kind of the default philosophy. In other picture modes, if you're watching a movie, input lag is irrelevant. And so we can bump up the processing and there's no penalty to you for doing that. You still might find a balance of, that's okay, that's too much enhancement. This is like Spinal Tap, these amps go to 11. I don't need my mind to go to 11 right now. Um, but you can strike that balance. In gaming, I, I again, I typically um, will, will recommend you you pay close attention to that um, a kind of trade-off and know that if the input lag for a particular game is not where you want it to be, you can regain some of that by turning down or closer to default some of those processing um, techniques in the system. Yeah. So you kind of mentioned the trade-off with the input lag. Um, I've noticed in the past that Sony typically does have a little bit higher input lag than other manufacturers. But when I actually play the games themselves, I don't notice a huge difference. Is there any testing that goes on with that to know like how much you actually keep on within the game mode? Because I'm not sure if this is why the, the game mode is a little bit higher in input lag because you leave some processing on. Um, yeah. Could you speak to that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that is part of the reason, because as I mentioned before, we never fully disable all processing. Um, a we view there's a difference between a monitor and a television, 
right? And so we make uh, gaming monitors. We About a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, we introduced kind of the Sony InZone line of PC gaming products. Uh, and so we make a monitor where the processing is not part of that equation. It's not what it's for. And so essentially whatever's coming out of your graphics card or your console, it's like the monitor is going to do that. You know, really low input lag, you know, you're off to the races. But for a television, um, there is a different kind of use case we imagine when we approach this product. And again, we do not believe in the philosophy of turning off all processing because there are variabilities, even within the TV that you own, that the processor needs to try to adjust for and account for. And you know, while again, we, we in game mode, we tend to lean more toward the input lag reduction, we're not gonna say we only care about input lag reduction and nothing else regarding the picture quality matters. Um, now, maybe other manufacturers lean that far, uh, and that's that's a fine distinction to kind of make. So a customer can decide, you know, wh what are they looking for? Are they looking for, you know, a 65-inch monitor where the emphasis is more on that experience? Mm -hmm. Or do they want, you know, in case of Sony, I would say it's a very compelling and competitive gaming platform, but when you're not playing games, it's a monster of a television for movies and TV shows. Um, but we try to strike kind of more of a balanced approach um, between those two. But processing is the difference. That's why there are TVs that have lower input lag. They will they will turn off even more baseline processing. Um, but that really puts you at the um, uh, kind of fully in the hands of whatever's coming from your source and whatever deficiencies are in the panel itself. You just have to you just have to live with them. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Good to know. So uh, one of the things that I do is I kind of look at different brands and I kind of pick different special traits that they have and I consider them X factors. I always look at something that they do that separates them from another brand. What would you say that Sony's X factor is when it comes down to like uniquely separating themselves from other brands? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm gonna give you kind of a cheap answer, but I'm gonna explain my reasoning for it. It really comes down to processing. Um, but here's, here's where there's actually, this, this conversation can be nuanced. If you are watching you know, just high quality content, and when I mean high quality, I mean, if you're watching like 99% 4K Blu-ray disc from Blu-ray player, or you're using like maybe a Kaleidoscape as kind of a, your movie server, um, processing plays a role, but it's a reduced role compared to you know, streaming um, with the 15 megabit per a second connection from you know, Netflix or from Paramount Plus or, or from whatever, right? If you are more of an active streamer, the upside for processing becomes much more significant. Uh, and so under those conditions, processing plays this more and more and more important role. So the more likely you are to stream content or kind of cut the cord or whatever word you want to use for it, the more important the, the processor is in terms of the overall uh, kind of result you're going to get. Um, but that is the most universal and single thing that I could point to that says this is what sets Sony apart. Now, obviously, the processor controls a lot of things. But if so, if you think about it from a streaming versus non-streaming, it's the easiest way, I think, for consumers to evaluate this very complex, you know, kind of piece of technology in a, in a television. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Um, so what goes into the thought process of what models you bring to the U.S.? Like I noticed last year, the X95L 85 inch was brought here, but in other regions, they got different sizes. Other regions got the X85L, which was full array. Um, and we got the carryover X85K which wasn't full array. So what goes into the decision process of, you know, decisions like these? So, so many things. <laughs> um, but I'll give, you the, I'll give you the short version. Essentially, it is a balance between uh, what, what Sony is trying to achieve, so kind of Sony Group, kind of the parent company, um, what Sony North America, the company I work for, is trying to achieve, and a negotiation with the vendors that sell our products. So we typically, at the beginning of a product cycle, actually really early, 
like sometimes 18 months before a product comes out, we're already having meetings with dealers and showing them, you know, early builds of, of the technology and talking about what it is and how it's different. You know, and sometimes they might look at it and say, you know, we really like, you know, these couple. I don't know that, you know, my market is is going to respond positively to that one. Maybe there's a lot of competition within that space. Or maybe there's not enough differentiation in their minds from the, the previous kind of cycle. And, and that is a different conversation for each of the major dealers that kind of play a role. There's obviously the, the big, you know, the, the big gorillas in the room, like the Best Buys and the Amazons. But we also have that conversation with lots of smaller regional dealers. And so it essentially is a negotiation that says, what um, is the best product mix? best technologies, the best sizes for the most dealers. And so in, 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 by extension, the most customers for us to bring in. Um, and that's essentially where that comes in. And sometimes it could be as simple as, um, you know, the, the price point between these two TVs is too, is too short. You know, uh, either no one will buy the cheaper one because it's $2 more to buy the better one, or it's no one, no, no one will, no one sees the value of, 50 bucks to get the step up model. So they kind of cannibalize each other. So those are the kinds of conversations that end up happening. Um, there are certainly going to be times when, when customers are going to look at it and be like, I sure wish I lived in Europe right now because I could go get a 65 inch X95L. So acknowledge that it's not a perfect system and that there are some of these discrepancies, but that's essentially the reason why it happens is that it's not, you know, not completely a Sony kind of you know, corporate decision. It's not completely a Sony, you know, uh, uh, SNA, Sony North America decision. And it's not entirely a dealer decision, but it's a combination of those three levels talking about what actually makes sense for the market to bring in. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I have a selfish question uh, for myself personally. Uh, so I follow 8K like very closely and I still kind of have this 8K dream alive. I'm always tra like chasing resolution. <laughs> And I noticed that Sony recently created a brilliant new full-frame 8K cinema camera. And with that in mind, do you ever see TVs fully making the shift to 8K or a higher resolution in the not-so-distant future? Uh, as far as the timing, that's hard. It's hard to kind of know. Um, several years ago, the CTA, that's the uh, Consumer Technology Association, got together and everyone agreed on like the, the kind of current standard that we're using for HDR. And this includes TV manufacturers, you know, Blu-ray Blu -ray makers, it's like, this is the language we're going to use. It calls for, allows up to 8K resolution, up to 480 frames per second, up to 12-bit color, 2020 color space, and maybe and 10,000 nits of HDR, right? And so um, as long as you don't exceed those, it's like everyone knows how to do it. As far as 8K specifically, um, here's the situation. Think back to the mastering monitor I mentioned kind of at the, at the beginning of this, when we're talking about the prototype. The reason 1,000 nit 4K movies are the standard is because that's the tool set that's available to movie makers today. Anything beyond that, is, it costs time and therefore money. So what would need to happen before mass 8K content became available is there, there, there would need to be an easier way to create and capture 8K content. Now, there are broadcast cameras where we can capture, like the Olympics um, uh, were, were captured and broadcast in a limited area in 8K. So the cameras are there. There's a lot of the intermediary kind of uh, technologies that don't exist yet, or they don't exist with the precision that is necessary, like in a mastering monitor, um, to, to say, yeah, here's an 8K mastering monitor that doesn't exist. So that's one of the major barriers currently. The other barrier, is that when high definition came out and 4K came out, largely there were only a couple of distributors. It was like, you know, you had Comcast or Cox or Dish or whoever, and like Netflix was the only streaming platform. And so they competed on service level. It's like, you know, dump Comcast, come over to Cox. We have twice the high definition channels, right? Modern distribution platform, um, the platforms are competing on IP. They're buying up rights or they're, they're buying exclusive deals with, with directors or cinematographers or, or whoever. And so they're trying to sway your, your purchase decision based on the content that they have, not the visual kind of quality of the content. 
what I think is going to happen is two things. The 8K technology to make it efficiently and cost effectively will be developed. And we've reached almost, I think, maximum saturation of how many streamers, streaming platforms you can have. I think you're going to start to see that constrict back down. And once it does, then you're going to have to compete on service level again. And then you're going to have a demand for content, not only from consumers, but distributors as well. And that's the perfect circle that's necessary, I think, to really pull the ripcord. Um, do I think AK is going to happen? I think it's inevitable. Um, in terms of the timing, that's harder to speculate because there are lots of uh, uh, different things I think need to happen before mass adoption um, would kind of would kind of um, uh, take place. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so I have one more question. This is a viewer question. They ask, how closely does the TV and the AV side of Sony work with the PlayStation gaming division specifically? Uh, I would say fairly close. You know, there there are um, with our what we call perfect for PlayStation Five. Um, we have worked with them to build in kind of unique convenience functionality for PlayStation Five owners when you pair it with a with a Bravia XR television, right? Um, but that being said, PlayStation um, certainly doesn't want to create a scenario where every customer who owns a Samsung goes, well, I guess PlayStation is not for me. I guess I got to go team green because there's too much kind of exclusivity. It's all of a sudden all of these really high-end features are locked behind a Sony TV. And so it is important for both our TV side and the console side to strike a balance between the two because while we are one Sony, we do have different kind of uh, uh, product strategy. And the same thing is true for TV. I don't want you know Xbox Series X owners to say, well, I, you know I, I'm I'm Team Green, therefore I have to go buy an LG. Mm -hmm. um, you know it's not compatible with the Sony, uh, but we do work with them on on essentially convenience features and also things like you know the the 3D Tempest audio, uh, the amazing immersive audio built into PlayStation Five, making sure that our televisions, our sound bars, our headsets uh, are are kind of compatible with those, and we work with our engineers to make those kind of things things happen. So it certainly exists, um, but we at least currently are not interested in like exclusivity um, because that's neither good for the console side or the TV side. All right. Well, that's all the questions that I got for you today, Rob. Thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. I just want to, again, express um, my appreciation for you taking time uh, to sit down and, and have a chat. Uh, I hope that uh, you and your community found this information interesting or uh, enlightening, ideally. Uh, and hopefully we can do this again in the future. But thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate you. Anytime, brother.